Hi everyone, this is Maverick Pua, the chemistry guru. Now in the topic on atomic structure, we have a discussion involving ionization energies, which in general it represents the amount of energy required for me to remove electrons from a particular atom or a particular species. So in this video, we want to discuss a specific trend, which is the first ionization energy trend across period three elements. Now the first ionization energy trend or the first IE trend across period three elements is given here. So in general, we need to roughly know the IE trend because we need to be able to explain a few things involving this particular trend. So we have our elements across period three, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. And in terms of the ionization energy, the trend is along this way. From sodium to magnesium, it increases, but there's a slight dip from magnesium to aluminum. Then from aluminum to silicon to phosphorus, it increases further. From phosphorus to sulfur, again, there's a slight decrease in the ionization energy. Then it increases further for chlorine to argon. So we actually notice altogether three things. The first idea is the general trend. It actually increases, it actually goes up. So in general, what we would expect is the first ionization energy trend would go up across period three. But of course, we notice that it is not a consistent increase. There are two discrepancy or there are two decreases in the ionization energy. The first one is between magnesium and aluminum. That means there's a dip in the ionization energy between this group two element and group 13 element. So aluminum, there's a slight decrease in the ionization energy. So later we will need to try to explain that. Now the second decrease in ionization energy or the second discrepancy is actually here from phosphorus to sulfur. So sulfur actually has a slightly lower first ionization energy than phosphorus. So we will need to explain that as well. So this is between group 15 and group 16 elements. All right, so let's try to explain these three observations part by part. So the first idea or the first trend that we observe is the general ionization energy will increase across period three. So the concept that we use to do this explanation is involving the concept of effective nuclear charge, which actually goes along this line. We know that across this period, there's an increase in the proton number, so proton number increases. So therefore, the nuclear charge would increase. Nuclear charge is just the charge of the nucleus, obviously. So the more positively charged the nucleus is, so the stronger the attraction that the nucleus will have on the valence shell electrons. So therefore, it will hang on to the electrons more tightly. It requires more energy for me to remove that particular electron. So in general, the higher the proton number, the bigger the nuclear charge, then the higher the ionization energy. And at the same time, I'm also increasing the number of electrons. So I'm adding electrons. But interestingly, what we are doing is we're adding electron to the same shell or the same principal quantum shell because all these guys, they are in the same period and it goes to three or where the principal quantum number is equals to three. So therefore, when I'm adding electrons to the same principal quantum shell, so in general, all these electrons are more or less the same distance from the nucleus. And usually if they are the same distance from the nucleus, then they cannot block each other. So we say that the shielding effect is relatively the same. Now the shielding effect, it is the effect caused by electrons from an inner principal quantum shell because they act as a barrier to block the attraction between the nucleus and the electrons that are further away from these inner shells. So we can think of it as a defender against the attacker. So if you have an attacker that is trying to score a goal, so if you want to be an effective defender, then what you have to do is you have to stand between the goalposts and the attacker. You won't stand beside the attacker or you won't stand further away from the goalpost than the attacker. Then you are effectively not particularly useful in terms of acting as a defender, right? So in order for you to be an effective shield, what you have to do is you have to be in between the attacker and the goalpost. So similarly for electron shells, in order for electron shells to function as an effective shield or effective screen, so it has to be in a inner shell. So only inner shell electrons can function as an effective shield or effective screen. So the shielding effect or the screening effect is effective. If the electrons are added to the same shell, so they are the same distance from the nucleus, in general, they don't really block each other. So the shielding effect is largely the same. So if I combine these two ideas, the nuclear charge increases. So therefore, there will be a stronger attraction between the nucleus and the valence electron. Electrons are added to the same shell. The shielding effect remains the same. So there's no difference in the blocking of the electrons 
due to the addition of all these additional electrons. So the effective nuclear charge would increase. So the overall attraction between the nucleus and the valence electron will increase. So therefore it requires more energy for me to remove the electron. The first ionization energy would go up. So therefore we notice across period 3, the first ionization energy increases. And if questions require us to talk about the first ionization energy trend across period 3, usually we just need to talk about the concept involving effective nuclear charge and we will ignore the anomalies because if we include the anomalies which requires discussion involving two different concepts that we will go through later, the answer will be very lengthy, the answer will be very long. So if the question never asks us to talk about the anomaly, then usually we just ignore that because most of the guys here, that means six out of eight elements here, actually obey this trend or it is consistent with the concept involving effective nuclear charge. All right, the second idea that we want to talk about, it is the first anomaly that we encounter, which is the decrease in the first ionization energy from magnesium to aluminum. Of course, if there's a discrepancy, then we cannot use effective nuclear charge to try to explain how come aluminum has a lower ionization energy anymore. So we have to depend on something else. What we do is we write out the electronic configuration and we see where the electrons are being removed from. So for magnesium, which has 12 electrons, because the proton number it is equals to 12, so there are 12 electrons as well. So writing out the electronic configuration, it will be 1s2, 2s2, 2b6, 3s2. So for magnesium, I'm removing the electron from 3s subshell. Now for aluminum, what we have is aluminum is aluminum 13. 13 electrons for me to fill up. 1s2, 2s2, 2b6, 3s2, 3p1. So if I'm removing electron for aluminum, then I'm removing the electron from 3p subshell. So what is the difference between removing the electron from 3p subshell in aluminum versus removing the electron from 3s subshell for magnesium is 3p subshell. It is further away from the nucleus or it has a higher energy. So I'm removing the electron from 3p subshell, which is further away from the nucleus or it has a higher energy level. So what this means is if the electron here, it is further away from the nucleus, then the attraction between the nucleus and the electron will be weaker. So therefore it is easier to remove. It requires less energy. For me to remove the electron, the ionization energy involving aluminum would be lower. All right, the third idea that we want to talk about is the second anomaly between phosphorus and sulfur. Now between phosphorus and sulfur, we also notice a slight dip in the first ionization energy. How come sulfur has a slightly lower first ionization energy from phosphorus? Again, if there's an anomaly, then we no longer use effective nuclear charge. And what we do is we look at the electronic configuration and we try to figure out where do I remove the electron from. So for phosphorus, P15, I need to fill up 15 electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 3s2, 3p3. So for phosphorus, I'm removing the electron from 3p subshell. Sulfur 16, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. So for sulfur, I'm also removing the electron from 3p subshell. So you notice if I just use this electronic configuration and I try to compare where I'm removing the electron from. Phosphorus, I'm removing electron from 3p. Sulfur, I'm also removing electron from 3p. So there's no difference, right? So what we have to do is we need to draw the electron in box diagram for the 3p subshell so that we can have a little bit more detail and we can scrutinize where am I removing the electron from or which specific electron I'm removing. So for 3p3, the electronic configuration for the electron in box diagram will look something like this. I have all electrons, all separate, and all of them are spin up. So 3p3 will look something like this. Now 3p4 for sulfur will be spin up, spin up, spin up, the fourth electron will be a spin down. So if I compare these two configurations, for phosphorus, I can remove electron from any of these three orbitals because these three orbitals, they are of the same energy level or we say that they are degenerate. So there's no difference in energy level. These three electrons are of the same stability. So therefore it requires the same amount of energy for me to remove any of these electron. Now for 3p4 in sulfur, what we will do is we will remove this electron that we have highlighted in blue here because this is the electron that is spinning down. And if I remove this electron, everybody else will be spin up and it will be in a ground state. So we know that for sulfur, the electron that I'm removing should be the one that is pointing down. So why is it easier for me to remove this specific electron? 
Now it is because this electron is actually sharing this orbital with another electron inside this same orbital. So this other electron will actually try to repel this electron because both electrons are negatively charged and they are sharing the same orbital. So there's a little bit of this repulsion between the two electrons inside the same orbital. So it is because of this additional repulsion between the two electrons which makes it easier for me to remove this electron that we have highlighted in blue here. So for sulfur, because I'm removing this electron that experiences inter-electronic repulsion between the electron pair inside the same 3p orbital. So remember the focus it is here. It is easier for me to remove this guy here which we have highlighted in blue because there's another electron inside the same orbital that is repelling it so it is trying to kick it out of the same orbital. So the keyword that we should be using is this inter-electronic repulsion between the electron pair inside the same 3p orbital. So therefore it is easier for me to remove this electron and the consequence will be sulfur will have a lower first ionization energy as compared to phosphorus. Alright, so that was the discussion involving the first ionization energy trends for period 3 elements. So if you have learned something useful from this video, please give me the thumbs up, like this video, and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more weekly video lessons. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.